it's interesting to hear these testimonies right now because uh, when I had the opportunity to be in Massachusetts, just a few days before that, there was a group from this church that now we are good friends with. They, they returned from Philippines and they went there for, if I'm not mistaken, two weeks. And there was plenty of people from there and they all started to share their stories of what happened in Philippines. And one after another, you could see their heart being broken. You can see literally some of them just shattered. They say, I don't know what I'm going to do now with my life. It's crazy. He said, I just don't know. And as they were talking, I waited until all they finished. And I advised them on something. I said that you got exposed to pain. And it feels painful. It feels awesome. But at the same time, it feels hopeless. Because in Philippines, you've realized you can help these people. You're not Bill Gates who can give half of his wealth to remove poverty and raise education in the world. You're not some brilliant person. You're coming to a world where you can put a band-aid on a girl or on a boy who lost their dad and their mom in a big tsunami and you're leaving two hours later. Your heart is broken and you know that there is so much more you would love to do but you cannot. And it's good to be exposed to pain. It refocuses you. It gives you perspective. But I told them about something else. I said, but there's another experience that you can have is when you get exposed to God. At first it seems, what difference does it make? The difference that it makes is when you get exposed to God, you don't walk out with perspective. You walk out with power. Every time you encounter God, you walk out of that place, whether you realize it or not, with a deposit of God's power inside of your soul. You walk out from that meeting, you walk out from that encounter with something inside of you. This grace that you can now live differently if you choose to. Moses had an, an, an exposure to pain in Egypt. He saw the pain and this pain messed him up so bad that we know that Moses eventually murdered a man trying to help his people. But Moses came to the conclusion, I can't help these people. They are too many. I'm just a one man. And he left the whole scene. But there was another time when Moses had another exposure and this time he had an exposure with God. He had an exposure with the supernatural power of God and God gave him the purpose and God gave him the power and now this man who 40 years later said I can't help these people came and not only helped these people but delivered them and thousands of years later in some unknown part in the world Tri-Cities Washington People still talk about Moses. Hollywood is releasing a movie about him toward the end of the year. And people still remember that story of how one man not just got exposed to the trouble and the pain, but he got exposed to the power of God to that degree where he got empowered by God to go and change his world. What is my point? The point is it's always good to be exposed to the wretchedness of human depravity. It's good when you surround yourself. The Bible says it's good to go to a funeral or to a wedding. It says it's good to go to a house of weeping and to the house of mourning, to, to the house of feasting. You know, even this week, some of you know when, you know, some of us who knew this young man in Tri-Cities, when the news announced that in jail he had a severe seizure and he passed away. And it's honestly, it's heartbreaking. When you hear stories like these, you know, you kind of like get exposed to people's pain. And you walk out, you begin to think about your life differently. And that is good. But we as Christians must understand the greatest exposure is not exposure to human depravity. It's to God's power. God's power is bigger than human error. God's name is bigger than our pain. And when you get exposed to who God is, when you get exposed to how great God is, you're not just walking out with a sense of, I had an awesome experience. You don't just have something to post on Facebook saying, blast, stupendous, awesome. But now you are responsible to do something about the encounter you have had. I want us to understand the world is expecting something out of us, church. Most of the people in our cities and in our regions doubt God and they have reasons to do so. Most of us here 
don't doubt God because all those reasons have been removed because you have seen in your own life and you have witnessed firsthand the mighty power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember when the young man even during this camp came to me the next day he said Vlad you talked about miracles you've talked about God opening blind eyes and deaf ears you've talked about lame walking and at that night I didn't pray specifically for the sick we prayed for something else and he said I would love to see that I said you know the last night there was a girl who was deaf in one ear and when I prayed for her and the, the, my hands left her ears her ear popped right open he said it can't be he said it can't be at this camp I said it happened at this camp and she will testify and immediately his demeanor changed and he says this is real I said it always was it never stopped being real <laughs> There's nothing too difficult for our God. When you get exposed to how great God is, something happens. It has to challenge you to go higher in faith. It has to challenge you to step out more in holiness. It has to increase your hunger for the Word of God. When you see the power of God, it has to change something about you. You can no longer live the same. Sometimes we feel like, well, if I had exposed to something super great, then automatically my life will change but it's not always the case we must understand is we have a role to play in making sure that once we are exposed to the power of God that we don't live the same that we now stretch ourselves a little bit more we push the boundaries a little bit more we step out a little bit more we take risks a little bit more and we give a little bit more we fast a little bit more we meditate on God's word a little bit more that we give ourselves to God a little bit more and only then we begin to see this power deposited into us begin to work mightily in our midst through the glory of God can somebody say amen you know and this kind of has been happening and some of you have seen and unfortunately we're getting to that part of our ministry where we're going to work on our recording the problem is when usually when I go to places um, I don't have anything on me except my iPhone to record with now phones have become our photo cameras video cameras our phone books and our Bibles our notebooks everything and so um, and as you see the recordings are really bad but talking to a lot of people I've started to notice one thing is that because we see a lot of wonderful things that the Lord does once a month during prayer lines this causes me as a Christian to take a little bit more and stretch my faith that when it's my time to pray for the sick I have a faith that's a little bit more stretched when I go to these camps and I see death ears open or somebody who could not walk because of his knee for three years and this young man that you saw the testimony you couldn't hear on Sunday he goes to very traditional church he came back to this church where the camp was in and testified again and he says it's been four days he said my knee doesn't hurt whatsoever I just got that text message before the service that challenges me when I come back home this is not a pat on the back say oh God does miracles this is a pat on the back say Vlad you just just a little bit more of faith just got opened for you push in a little bit further a little bit more of hunger for God's word just got released to you push in a little bit further a little bit more of who God is and what he wants to do just got open to you it's like you know when you play that uh, sugar uh, what's the addiction game candy crush and there's a certain level and then you get unlocked another level that's exactly what happens when you see miracles. God unlocks another level for you in your faith. Somebody say amen. amen. Your faith has been unlocked. Another level has been unlocked in our life and in our destiny. Somebody say hallelujah. I just really want to challenge that each person who came from Colombia, each, each one of us who witnesses these things, please let's not stay on the same level. Let's not be on the same level. Let's step it up remember God unlocks another level in your life another level of trust in him another level of love for him another just this little bit further of just peace in him joy in him relaxation in him of just literally leaning on him being led by him take it as the Lord is unlocking another level and that's how we are gonna grow amen and that's how God is going to open the doors and we're gonna see crusades where we're gonna go as a team minister to thousands thousands of people and people will be healed saved and delivered somebody say yes amen
If you have your Bible for the brief moment that we have together, I want to read to you one verse that is no stranger to neither of us. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 17. Isaiah 54 and verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. I want to speak to you briefly from this scripture. And if you take notes, you can title it Condemning Condemnation. Condemning Condemnation. We encourage uh, in our church to take notes. We encourage in our church to post notes on your Facebook, on your Twitter, on your Instagram and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ also through social media. Condemning Condemnation. A few weeks ago it was very interesting uh, thing that was happening in my office upstairs is um, there was just this uh, old smell that was there and I decided to light a candle and because I didn't have matches with me but I had this um, what do you call that thing when you uh, the lighter yeah I had a lighter and I had a candle that was very deep in the glass and so there was no way I could put the lighter inside of the glass without burning my hand because I tried and I burned my hand <laughs> And it was hurting so I decided to do something that you should never do and I decided to light a piece of paper <laughs> and put the piece of paper into the candle well the candle was really big and I knew I'll uh, quench it and I'll run downstairs and throw the paper into the toilet and that's exactly what I did I, I lit up the piece of paper I started the candle and I took the paper ran quickly downstairs throw it in the toilet and flashed it down I walk upstairs I walk into the room and literally there's a smoke in the room it smelled like something is on fire though there was no longer fire and I started to open the windows to get the smoke out but there was no fire there but the smoke came though the fire was gone and sometimes I'm reminded that there are certain occasions in our life and certain things including sin when you get saved when you give your life to Jesus and you come to the altar or you get on your knees before the Lord whatever you are at and Jesus forgives your sin and you know that you know because God's word says so that Jesus forgives our sin when we are asking him but the problem many times continues is that sin brings something called guilt shame regret condemnation it's that kind of a thing where it judges you with your own kind of voices inside of your head and though you're forgiven you still have that kind of a, like if I could say this smoke in your mind something triggers that memory and many people will choke in their Christian life. Many people will suffer in their Christian life. Though they're forgiven, but they don't know how to deal with the guilt. Sometimes an occasion happens when somebody gets a very painful event in their life. Whether it's a divorce of their parents, or maybe it's a breakup of a relationship. Or maybe somebody who you trusted and you put your confidence in betrays you and turns against you. And this does something very, very hurtful. And it seems like your world collapsed. Everything shattered. Maybe you got a life-threatening disease and the doctor's diagnosis have said that you literally don't have much to live. Maybe a loss of a loved one or a friend. Something that is so painful that happens. And there is that mourning period, there is that sorrow period that lasts for a while. But after that period, we are done with that period. Usually there is that kind of cloudness, heaviness that still exists from an event that has happened in someone's life. And today we are going to just take this scripture and learn something that the Lord teaches us of how we can overcome these occurrences that happen in our life. I remember being in uh, last week in Seattle and I heard a very unfortunate story a friend of mine who's a youth pastor had a young man who who had a girlfriend and they were in a relationship and everything was good until one day I don't know the details but the relationship fell apart and she walked away from him and it was a very heartbreaking experience like it would always be and instead of you know taking a few months to just kind of recover that relationship devastated the rest of his life and he lived for a year and a half after that still being broken over something that happened a year and a half ago and two weeks ago he committed suicide he was a Christian man and they the whole youth group you I when I walked in that I could sense this shock this kind of like disappointment 
how could someone be a, you know a Christian and have something bad happen to them and yet not deal with it not kind of shake it off I mean I understand three months being sorrowful but a year and a half you're a young man and something is not right with that when I was in Massachusetts a few days before that at the last service I had this very strong word in my heart that there was one person in that meeting who was com contemplating suicide and when I'm praying and just kind of praying praying and I tried to avoid it because I kind of knew most of the people there and I'm like they might be contemplating other things but suicide is not one of them and so I'm debating with my mind but but I just went ahead and said it and there was one wonderful young man that came in for for prayer and um, turns out that similar situation happened to him he's an American man who went to a Russian church and two years before that he proposed to a Russian girl in front of a Russian church and they were prepared to get married everything's supposed to be fine until three weeks before the wedding she called it off and of course he felt so embarrassed he felt so ashamed it shattered his world he said Vlad I stopped going to this church I stopped going to church I immersed myself into work I disconnected myself from God I got involved with illegal drugs and I contemplated suicide already and when he came to the front we prayed after prayer he says I felt something leave me and that very night he gave his life to Jesus Christ he's, he's probably gonna listen to this message because he still writes and we communicate and he says Vlad I'm going back to the church Jesus Christ is disconnecting me see the event that happened is long gone but the effects of that event were still lingering at first when something bad happens or even your sin your condemnation and you hold on to it for the first few months the problem is this is after those few months that starts to hold on to you and most people that I meet they first hold on to something bad that happened to them hold on to the guilt and shame and and just these words people spoken over them hold on to their past or hold on to certain things that have happened in their life they hold on to it because it's so dear because it seems so right because it feels a relief and after a while they say you know what I think I'm ready to go but now these things are holding on to them and they cannot let it go without divine intervention and today we are here to let every single person know you don't have to hold on to your past you don't have to hold on to your sin you don't have to hold on to your addiction you don't have to hold on to your shame you don't have to hold on to your guilt and you don't have to hold on to your bitterness you don't have to hold on to anything and if something is holding on to you you have a name that is bigger than any other name if he could disconnect a young man named journey jeremy in massachusetts he can disconnect you he, he, he disconnected donkey so the donkey can be used by jesus he can disconnect you today for the glory of god it may be something as small as fear at night it may be something as big as suicidal thoughts that you cannot shake off it may be something as big as the abuse when you are a little child and is still hovering over your life and pushes you to immorality but i have a news for you at the good news church jesus christ still sets the captives free and if you are a captive he has freedom for you somebody say yes somebody say amen so jesus is able to do that when we refuse to hold on to it and we hold on to Jesus and his word he is able to set us free he is able to give us another day and give us another chance this verse that we read today it says that no weapon formed against you will prosper and every tongue that rises against you in judgment you will condemn I'll just unpack this in just a moment but I want to let you know that the enemy I think it was prophet T.B. Joshua said he says Satan doesn't come to you with his weapons loaded shooting on you he said the way Satan comes is usually through your feelings through your fears and through your circumstances and he fills your mind with fear and anxiety and this becomes it's as though his pipe through which he carries all of his sin and his power into your life if you think that Satan will come knocking on the door and say I am Lucifer from the pit of hell you're mistaken that will never happen 
the way satan will come against you is he will come through your worries through your fears through your pain and sometimes through your bitterness and through your hate he will use that to seek to get to you through those feelings and if you're not careful to allow these voices and these feelings to come into your life without censorship you will unknowingly ignorantly let satan come into your life and he will destroy you let me remind you satan did not unleash his power to the world without opening his mouth to our ancestors and it was after they believed what he said it was after they heeded his voice that they opened their life for his power he didn't bring one sickness, one heartache, one murder, one suicide, one horrible sin. Not one thing was brought on this earth until Satan found an ear that was open to what he had to say. When your ear is open to what he has to say, your life will be open to what he has to do. Satan doesn't come crashing your life until he first invades your heart through your ears. He sends the voices that come through your feelings and your circumstances. They come through the people in the past who have said you are worthless. You will never make it. Look at your life. It's full of setback and sins. Maybe it's your sin crying out to you saying you are just stupid. You are a sinner and Satan slips in through that. When you open your life to that you open your life to his power and the same thing is opposite true when we open our life to the word of God we open our life to the spirit of God when we open our life open our life to the voices of the devil we open our life to his vices his evils and his power amen and what the Lord is saying through prophet Isaiah he says no weapon formed against you will prosper what he's saying is satan has weapons of disappointment defeat break up in life but they will not prosper and he says this is why because every voice that rises against you in judgment you will condemn it imagine this you are in a courtroom and satan has evidence against you there is facts there is circumstances there is evidence you've done it and here is the record and the enemy forces the record against you to say you are not righteous you are not good enough you are not holy god is not gonna bless you and he forces that and you look at that evidence and if that's the only thing that you see he will judge and condemn you you will walk out of that being condemned you will walk out of that saying you know what god is not going to love me god is not going to use me all of these good promises there for good kids um, i happen not to be one of them and guess what happens then satan's weapons become effective because wherever his voice is heated his vices will not be resisted when we are open to his voice we will be open to his vices but this is what God gives us the promise for he says Satan will have the facts the enemy will have the proof and when all of this is done he says you will rise against those voices and you will condemn them how if you did drugs and he says you're a drug drug addict if you drink and he says you're an alcoholic if you were abused and he says you're destroyed if you were heart was broken and you feel like you're a failure how can you silence a voice that says the truth how can you condemn a voice that rises in judgment against you and that this voice has proof and God gives us the secret God says because their righteousness is from me God said the reason why they'll be able to stand up to every fact Satan throws in them 
is because they know one thing is the righteousness does not come from the works it doesn't come from their deeds it doesn't come from their past it comes directly shipped from heaven as a gift and they tell the enemy you know what enemy you've included all of my sins against me you missed few let's add all of them up there's some things I've done you don't even know about let's put all of that stuff if you want to be real let's get real let's get down and dirty let me tell you everything and after we are done with this take red ink and cross it from one side of the paper to the other because it was all washed by the blood of Jesus Christ I am righteousness from God let the enemy throw his best case against you but after all of this is done the bible says the reason they will condemn those voices is not because they know how to argue not because they're religious people not because they don't miss church even though that's important but because they know my righteousness does not come from my virginity my righteousness does not come from my bible reading my righteousness does not come from my attendance of church my righteousness comes as a gift from a man who 2000 years ago willingly gave himself to hang on the calvary and paid for all of my sin the ones i've done the ones i've thought of doing and the ones i wished i wouldn't do all of those sins he paid for that today I can take his righteousness upon myself and when the tongues are against me I can rise up and say you got the wrong person in the courtroom because this person has was judged on the cross the new person that's here is the righteousness of Jesus Christ and when you walk out of this kind of a courtroom the Bible says no weapon formed against you can prosper because no tongue rises against you will succeed if you don't let the devil succeed speaking against you you will stop him planning attacks against you you will be able to stop his weapons or oh, he will make those weapons he will throw them at you maybe even sickness will come against you but there's something going to be about you you're going to walk around and say i am healed by the stripes of jesus christ you're saying you know what satan get the garbage back to yourself because i believe what the word of god says weapons cannot prosper if his voices do not find a place in our head can somebody say amen? amen and this is what God says no weapon formed against you will prosper no tongue that rises against you you will condemn in judgment and he says this is the heritage of the Lord the righteousness is from me this is the heritage of the Lord you know what that means you're God's offspring you're God's possession. Can I put you in the plain language? You belong to God. Now this might be small, but that simply means you don't belong to sickness. That simply means you don't belong to depression. You're not the offspring of suicide. You're the offspring of the Lord. God says these weapons, Satan, you got against them. They're not going to prosper. These people are not yours these people don't belong to their boyfriends or their girlfriends they belong to me I am their father these people don't belong to some event that happened when they were three years of age these people belong to an event that happened when they were not even born at the Calvary these people don't belong to their sickness they belong to their healer they don't belong to their defeat they belong to their victor they don't belong to their poverty they belong to one who owns the thousand hills and a thousand cattle who owns everything in this universe God says this is my heritage your weapons cannot succeed you got wrong people Satan these are wrong people they don't belong to you they don't belong to some weird events in their life they belong to me and because of that you can fire the shot but it won't hit them why I'm gonna protect them and the reason come on and the reason why they will not allow these things to come into their life is because they will stop the voices that come against them in their tracks I want to encourage you tonight and let you know that Jesus Christ is on your side as a Christian you have righteousness not because you feel it but because you believe it 
you have righteousness because Jesus died on the cross and today you have to walk in that righteousness it's easy to walk in that righteousness when you don't smoke you don't drink everything is fine and it seems like you didn't do anything bad but in that moment never lean on how you feel always lean on what God says don't feel when you feel good that doesn't mean you're righteous you are righteous because God says you're righteous Amen. you are not righteous because you feel righteous you should feel righteous because you are righteous because of Jesus Christ and when the enemy throws things against you you have to let him speak but then after that you have to say Satan my righteousness came as a gift I'm so sorry it never was offered to you but it was offered to me I did exactly the same thing that you did you're going to hell but I'm going to heaven because my God loves me so much Can somebody say amen I declare over your life that the weapon Satan planned will not prosper in Jesus name I declare the weapons of all kinds of nightmares, the weapons of sickness, the weapons of setback, the weapons of depression, the weapons of suicide, the weapons of lack, the weapons of sickness and all kinds of demonic attacks will not prosper because you belong to God. Come on somebody say amen. And the voices Satan sends against you, you will condemn. Say I will condemn every voice. Say every voice that rises against me in judgment say every weapon say every weapon that satan plans against me will not prosper say because i belong to god and somebody say amen i know this is simple but this is the truth and is able to set you free